and I saw he had been shot through the neck, leaning over, and he dropped his gun. And I heard it hit, it smacked, and then it heard him gurgle. His blood was pumping out. It hit him in the throat going that way. And I left, but I took him with me by his, his pack strap. Anyway, we got him back to the, the medics came up and carried him back. He died about uh, 20 minutes later. And I lost squad leader, but anyway, nope. It was just a, a fluke. That's the only close friend I saw die right by me. I wouldn't want my children doing the same thing I did, my son, and certainly not my daughters. Warning, the frontline testimony you're about to hear is, at times, extremely graphic. The realities of war are often difficult, but it's vitally important that these stories are told and the lessons are learned. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello, my name is Marvin Kent, Company D, 1st Battalion, 149th Infantry, 38th Division. It's something that uh, I know I'm proud of that I got to do. I was proud enough of it. I saw action on Leyte, on New Guinea, Leyte, and Luzon. What was your specific job in Company D? It was a firing a machine gun. I was the machine gunner, a machine gunner. There was four. And what type of machine gun? It was a water-cooled 30 caliber and it was heavy duty. You could continue to fire for hours before you'd burn a barrel up as long as it was, the water was in it, it cooling. We head from Hawaii to New Guinea, and as we went between uh, Australia and New Guinea, we looked for and destroyed Japanese, and then we headed toward, I guess that's west of New Guinea, and uh, the last of the Japs were down around Port Moresby. Yeah, I guess that's the right place. And uh, by the time we got there, they were, we weren't running into anymore. Uh, somewhere in this book, they tell you how many of us killed because Americans have a habit of when they kill people or they injure people, they try to account for them. And, uh, it shows the displeasure that they had. They just covered them up with a bulldozer if they had one behind. They just push them in a pile if there's enough to push. That's what we did in the Philippines because there was plenty. This is Japanese bodies. On the actual day you guys made the invasion uh, on the beachhead of New Guinea, when you're going in on those alligators, are you taking on any fire? Not there, because we, they were far enough up. It was just a village, and the village was living back in there. And the intelligence said we could get off there easy. We took fire on Bataan, but not in New Guinea. So not a single shot when you guys no. landed in New Guinea? Which was good, because the, <laughs> the, the freeway... <laughs> The freeboard on that alligator was about a foot. So if you wiggle too much, it, you know, it's, you can sink that thing too. But anyway, we got in without any efforts there. Well, the first enemy I came across where the infantry in front of us had killed them and we just walked by them. It's, it's, you know, it's a dead body. You know, I, I, don't, I don't remember any special feeling. I do know that I was careful even I knew that I was in the in the third wave, so I knew there was three three waves in front of me when I hit over on Baton. But yes, there were still some snipers around, even after there had been uh, three companies unloaded in front of us and headed on out to the beach. Can you tell us, do you remember when you were on New Guinea, the first live Japanese uh, enemy that you came across? Didn't come across a live one on New Guinea. All I saw was dead ones. There wasn't much action for you guys? Well, I said they're scattered between between those little villages. And once they get past the village, 
then you just leave strays because they had been left there now uh, several months since the Japanese ship had been back in there. I, mean, I told you earlier that apparently when the Japanese left those islands and the United States started taking them, however they got word to them, they told them they were on their own. So they started doing backing off and getting into mountains and getting where it was difficult and just trying to retain a, as many alive as long as they could. Because we were following behind because that, that was our job was to follow. And if they needed more firepower, we'd go up and put it on. But because you didn't come across any live ones, that means mm -hmm. the infantry took care of them. They took care of them. It was just uh, 90 miles of, of walking. For us in heavy weapons, we, I never set my, my gun up except at night. I set it up at night in case I needed it. But other than that, I only took it off my shoulders to rest and not to use it because by then the two infantry companies that that we were walking behind had taken care of whatever live Japs there were. And, and it was a 90 mile march over a period of three or four weeks, five weeks. You, you mentioned earlier about, you know, the first time you fired was on Leyte and it was covering fire for the infantrymen. Um, can you give a little bit more of a visual? I mean, what are you actually firing into? A clearing or? Across, across a field into, into woods. Uh, it, uh, if, if, if you gave me 10 minutes, I could cut a tree for you. You know, you, it, it penetrates pretty good. And uh, you just sit down and level and you, you shoot into whatever looks like it's good cover for somebody. You just know that there's somebody across there and that's what you do. You, you, you sort of wake them up so the infantry can find them. And you hope that you, you hope you cut them up and the infantry then, they charge. They'll, they get up and go across as a unit and, uh, they do the heavy work. They uh, they get them out of the holes and they get them out of the trees and wherever. They didn't get far through the first day because they came back across and spent the night with us. The next morning we did the same thing. And there was less over there for that time, but they went across and found. Can you talk about your experiences with Japanese snipers Hmm, yeah. I've been shot at by Japanese snipers, but they were not too accurate. They killed my squad leader standing right behind me, but they didn't. Can, can you take us through that incident? What happened? Well, they, uh, my squad leader, I, I, had, I had set up where I could look over the hill and down to a valley where I was our guns were covering that in the hillside across from us. And uh, <clears throat> I sat up and, and I, every once in a while I'd hear a sniper shot, so I was just being careful. And uh, the squad leader was carrying an M1 and I carried a 45 and, and the machine gun. I borrowed his M1 because I kept, down at the base of the hill, I kept seeing some grass, well, Marcetti and myself. He was the uh, assistant gunner. And, and we kept seeing it. And we'd hear a shot, but he, the bullet wasn't going our way. But somebody was moving in that grass down at ground level. So I borrowed the M1 and I, I kept shooting down at that particular point. And periodically, the grass would move and you'd hear that Japanese rifle. And he was seeing something I wasn't seeing. But anyway, 
my squad leader decided he, uh, he wanted to shoot his own gun. I told him, don't come. And the assistant gunner said, don't come. We are hid pre pretty much. He can't see us for the same reason we don't see him. And so anyway, he came. And he got off two shots at some other place. He, he thought he saw somebody. You didn't always see what you were shooting at with a machine gun. The infantry people, they were up among them. They saw them. But anyway, I heard Snyder grunt. I glanced over my shoulder, and I saw he had been shot through the neck, leaning over, and he dropped his gun. And I heard it hit, it smacked, and then I heard him gurgle. His blood was pumping out. It hit him in the throat going that way. And I left, but I took him with me by his, his pack strap. We, I, I rode with him over for about 10 feet out of the way and over the hill. And Marcetti came out. I don't know why that name popped into my head, but that was his system. Anyway, we got him back to the, the medics came up and carried him back. He died about uh, 20 minutes later. And then I discovered I had been hit lightly in the shoulder, the shoulder that was pulling his trap. So I don't know, that had to be the guy, but we, did, we didn't kill him. Somebody did because we walked down through there uh, the next morning, I guess, and there was a dead jump lying down there, so it, I'm sure we didn't kill him, but somebody got him, and I lost the squad leader, but anyway, nope, it was just a, a fluke. If he had stayed over behind us where he should have been, he wouldn't have died, but anyway, that's the that's the only close friend I saw die right by me. Cause I walked back to get my shoulder bandaged uh, and sat down by him before he died. He, but he couldn't talk. So anyway, that. I'm sorry not, you had to go through that. Oh no, it was no no problem. It, it's, I don't dwell on it because he knew we were over there and he knew that we lost people out of the company. Off and on, not as much as the infantry company did, but regularly somebody would be hit with a sniper or a uh, mortar shell would drop close enough to wound somebody. So it, it's, it's just what, it's part of life. Your squad leader, can you tell us a little more about him? What kind of person was he? he oh, everybody was nice people. I mean, they, they were nice American people. He was from Ohio, had a family. He liked to play penny any poker. He smoked. I mean, I just, he, he was like me. He was just uh, somebody that had been carried over there. And his, his name was Snyder. Do you remember his first name? No, but I bet he don't rem wouldn't remember mine either. Could you just use they the last name? They called me Alabama most of the time. I was the only Alabamian in that unit, in that <laughs> company. <laughs> um, are there any other uh, close calls you remember on Leyte? Not to me personally. I know we we had other other battles, but they were on other mountains, on other hills and valleys. And uh, we finished, as I said, in about, uh, Leyte was close to three months. And then we got on the ship and went to, to Luzon. Talk to us about that. How do you get from Leyte to Luzon? Well, we went back out to the, to the port that we came in close to which was a SED, I didn't know the name, but it's Lingay on Gulf, 
and we went back out and got on troop transports and headed north around the tips of Luzon and came into Baton and made our beachhead on Baton. That one, there was somebody shooting at us, but they were shooting at the rifle companies. I got off that that landing craft with my tripod on my back and not, not a gun in my hand. So we were, again, as I told you, we were third or fourth um, uh, route to hit the beach. Wave. You know, at at uh, Baton. The rifle companies hit it first and they're the ones that take most of the casualties and then they also give most of the casualties. So by the by the time you got on the beaches I, well I'm they're they're five, six hundred yards away. Either dug in that far away or whatever. But we get off our problem is not to be dropped in deep water because we're carrying 50, 60 pound extra weight. So anyway, we make, well, we made three beachheads and as far as I know, my company didn't have a first round fired at them. <coughs> I know that the, the, the landing craft that I was on each time, the, 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 the seaman that was running it could have run it up on the beach and, and been safe. What do you remember about the American casualties on the beach of, you know, of the rifle companies ahead of you? Were there ca a lot of casualties on well, the no, beach? No, there wasn't a lot considering it. There might be, might be 500 people going in at the same time. There might not be, but 50 or 60 did come up with a wound or two, and you might not even have any deaths, but then you're possibly you're going to have kills. But whoever you're walking over out there is dead when you get through with it. That's that's what they do. We went around to the rainforest and came from Manila back toward the ocean through Zigzag Pass and to the, the regular defended routes. For those who don't know, could you describe what was Zigzag Pass? Well, he was coming from the ocean. You came through the, uh, it was a Bataan Road, came right through the middle of Bataan, which was the peninsula, and there's a pass that had a lot of S-curves in it. They called it Zigzag Pass. Um, and they had defensive places all over it. And they had defensive places coming in. <coughs> And all of their weapons, the heavy weapons, were aimed toward the ocean so that they could stop people on that road. Uh, my battalion walked through the rainforest for about, it took us two and a half days. And we came in behind those fortifications. There was no weapons, heavy weapons, but pointed the way we came in. And, and our infantry troops quietly drove on up to them and stuck weapons in the ports back there that they had for, for v ventilation and stuff and just killed them. They couldn't turn a gun around to shoot because they were permanent. I'll say that because that's what it was. Less than 30 days to take Baton and Corregidor back. That's why they got this. Avengers of Baton on this book. Yeah, hold that up that, to the camera. That's great. <laughs> and what was the the infantry, what was the main weapon they would use to knock out the Japanese? Well, they had hand grenades. They hit up where they can throw them through the... They throw a, a hand grenade in or they shoot a rifle grenade. And once they get up against this wall or the uh, outside where they away from a port, gun port, they can throw anything they want to in there. Fort Drum, they took Fort Drum over on the Manila, on the, on the 
way to the ocean is they, they had a concrete concrete and fort embankment. They had all kind of weapons that they guarded the bay and to, to uh, anyhow to the, to the city, the big port to the, where they hauled all the ships. And they came in behind it and pumped diesel fuel and gasoline and stuff in it and set it on fire down inside and they burned whatever Japanese were in there. That's how they captured it. Can you tell me what did the, the, the offensive positions at Zigzag Pass, or, you know, what you did had, they look like? You had roadblocks. They had, had actually uh, a defensive position that had a weapon, a heavy weapon in it, mortars. It also had uh, howitzers in it that pointed down the roads. And it zigzagged past, they covered it from hillside uh, fortifications where you could shoot down the road with a artillery piece, machine guns, and what have you. The backside, there wasn't any use in fortifying it. It was just a part of the original, and you could come in from the back. Nobody from Manila, as far as they figured, when the Americans set it up, the Japs had to come from the coast. They weren't coming from inside. And we went and came in from the inside. These are Japanese reusing American fortifications. That's all they did was rebuild them so that they could stop the Americans coming in. They assumed that's the way they'd come. They didn't think that you guys are smart enough to go behind. Well, they didn't think anybody would walk through that rainforest. It was just a, a branch of the hill. It's, it's jungles back out through there, but had big trees and what have you. Well, Describe they, the difficulties of going through the jungle. Well, the, the rainforest itself was nothing but climbing over the hills and, you know, the various things in there. It was slow. And it was time consuming. And it was difficult physically. We carried our water, we carried uh, our food, and they dropped us food and water after we came out on the other side. The uh, Air Force did, Army Air Force. And we came out on that side, and then we went over and got back onto the roads that came out of Manila and massed our battalion and just headed out. And the companies would, would you know, alternate over each other. You, you know, you mentioned that you helped provide covering fire uh, towards these pillboxes. Well, there's more than one, but as, as, you, as your, the company leaped and they needed it, then you park up on a hill somewhere where you can see what you're doing. And you're not the only one. You've got several machine guns that they all sit. And then you got artillery, the mortars. And uh, we carried, our company carried 281 mortars and carried uh, the basic load for that. And that's, that's pretty heavy. But we managed to climb out of the hills up there. And uh, it's, it's, it was like the rainforest they show you. They, they, it, we did some of our training in High Warrior. They have a, Mahu has a nice rainforest. You know, those times you talk about firing, though, at the, at the defensive fortifications, <clears throat> did the Japanese always hold up? inside or did you ever see them outside and fire? Oh no, they're, that's where they were set and told to stay and that's what they did. So you, you never, you, they never came out? No, because they, did, they knew if they did, they'd be hit anyway. And, and most of them just died right in the, in the pit because somebody would get an explosive hand grenade or rifle grenade 
or something inside. When you were overseas, do you remember flamethrowers being used? Oh yeah, and the, the uh, Air Force, the Air Corps dropped napalm bombs. We burned jungles off of the hillsides <clears throat> with those, and uh, that's uh, some of the companies. Well, our our heavy weapon company had two of these napalm backpacks. Flamethrowers. But I, I can explain it, but I didn't use one. Yeah. You, you have your napalm in a in the back and you have pressure cartridges that push it and you're walking is you got a it's hooked up just like you'd have a washer. That you're out here washing the building off. Only when you pull the trigger it squirts that napalm out and there's a arc welder type spark sets it on fire and you can spray it and you can spray that that flame out there up to 150 feet and it'll 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 kill you the air force dropped napalm bombs and they set them to to explode sometime early in the air they'll have a trigger on the front they'll set them explode them and it's just a wall of fire comes down or if they're trying to burn off a, a place like they did in Vietnam and again we did over there so we could see the caves they were in then they drop a bomb and then it burst on the ground so you've got a mass of that the reason they call it napalm it sticks and it's going to burn and it, you just burn the jungle off and then you can see see the ground. When I was reading up on your outfit, they talked about after you all went behind and knocked out the Japanese at the Zigzag Pass, you went into the, the hills beyond Manila. Your division was credited with uh, knocking out about 26,000 Japanese, killing 26,000 Japanese but your division had about 600 killed. Yeah. That's a, that's a huge ratio. Yeah, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fair ratio. The Japs didn't have any big heavy guns because they took them off those islands when they were they're fighting the Marines and everybody else on the smaller islands that they seemed to think was being protective of the homeland. They, all the time we were advancing in the Pacific, this is the difference between most enlisted men and me, I guess. I tried to figure out where they disappeared to. But they, as they had to reinforce where MacArthur was trying to cut in around these people, he isolated these t islands till the last. They had taken off a bunch and then their Navy got decimated enough they couldn't bring more people. And then they got to so spread out they couldn't bring many. And they wouldn't bring them off the main island because they knew we were coming. They, they, I, I like the expression the Japanese, I forget which general it was, said when he hit Pearl Harbor, said, now you've awakened the major giant, you, you, you've awakened him from sleep. And, and that's where we were headed. When, when we finished in Luzon, uh, President Truman had just shortly been sworn in as president, and they briefed him on, the, on that atomic weapon. When he dropped that atomic weapon on, on Japan, and Roosevelt wouldn't have dropped it, I don't think. I think he would have let us be shipped over there. But we would have lost more people taken to Japan main island than the Japan people lost from our fighting plus the nuclear weapons. Because everybody over there would have fought you with with a fork, the eight wheels, or the chopsticks, anything. 
the men, the women, they, they, whatever weapon they had, because they would die for their emperor. Americans don't want to die for anybody, but they will if you push them. No, I, I definitely want to ask you about that, uh, how you heard about the bombs being dropped. Well, uh, that's uh, they were, we heard about, they, they burned at large places in Japan because they went at flimsy buildings. They flew uh, planes that just set fire. They just firebombed them before they sent the, the regular planes. They trained them in Pensacola, a lot of several of them, and, and then they, they flew off of the islands as they took the smaller ones. And they even had some that could get off of a carrier, because we got carriers pretty close in there too. But the thing that, that, that beat Germany and the, and the Japs is our people were building ships uh, that transported goods from us to our so-called allies. We gave Russia billions of dollars worth of stuff and uh, we never got it back and they still don't like us. And we gave China a great deal of stuff and they don't like us. The Japanese like us pretty good. We buy their cars. <laughs> when you were in combat, did you have a any experiences against Japanese armor? Any tank, Japanese tanks or trucks that you came across? Trucks had already been destroyed. They, by the time we got inland, the Air Force had gotten to where they could fly over anywhere they wanted to. There was no, no Japanese Air Force. And trucks were, <laughs> they'd get out on the road and they strafed them. They were looking for things to shoot up. So. And tanks, they didn't have any tanks. They didn't move many tanks into, into those islands. And, and their tanks, by the way, were rather poorly built. But now they had some good airplanes, but they again were fast, but they were, didn't, wasn't built for any kind of security for a pilot. Did, did you, when you were overseas, did you have experiences being strafed or bombed by the Japanese? Nope. See, by the time we got over there, they were just trying to defend their own home island. What about Washing Machine Charlie? Oh, that was that was one of those things. That you, there's always one of those, but they didn't, didn't drop anything. It wasn't but anything. For those who don't know, what's Washing Machine Charlie? He's a guy who'd come over toward sundown. <laughs> he'd come over early in the morning, and he'd it, it, look. Maybe he'd drop a little old bum or something, but. It, it, they always seem to have one, one little plane hanging around somewhere that they could they could bring up, but it wasn't uh, something that was consistently using. He wasn't trying to kill nobody; he's trying to see where they were. When you were in combat, did you have any experiences against Japanese mines or booby traps? No. By, we had so many infantry people in front of us that, that that was the safest place to be. Sure. Talk to me about souvenirs. Did you ever go souvenir hunting? Nope. I'm sure you knew guys who did. I knew a, a Kentucky guy that knocked the teeth out after he walked over and took the gold and prized it loose from a tooth and put he used to send it home after they got away, he could send a little package. What do you think about that? That was his thing, it wasn't mine. He liked the gold in the mouth. All of them had some kind of gold feeling. Would you ever have to search the, the enemy dead though for any? There was always somebody in front of me. Who would do that? It, it did that. They were close up and they did that. But this, this one particular young man, 
not young men. I was a young man. They were old people. Uh, he was a scout. He didn't want to be anything but a scout. And, and every month he shot, he knocked their teeth out and checked them for gold. Take his rifle, stop and pop them. And that, that everybody just called him the gold man. <laughs> Did you go on any patrols in combat? Not me. I am not stupid. I would have if I had, if it ordered me to, but no. And also, because you're heavy weapons, they don't really go on patrols no. like riflemen do. No. No, I, I, I said I'm not stupid. I, I was stupid to be in the infantry because I spent many years after that getting away from the infantry. When you were in combat, your whole time in combat, sir, what was the closest you got to the enemy in a firefight? A live Japanese or Japanese soldiers in an actual oh, fire? Oh, the guy where I picked up my little, little uh, purple heart. That was the closest. I was close enough to get shot with a rifle. Most of the time, I was two companies back from him. Oh, he had to be at 100 yards or less. But, you know, I didn't see him. I, I didn't see him. And it came, it came from the wrong direction to be our troops, so it, it had to be one. And there were some dead ones, but we both on forward. There were some dead ones on our way out of where we were. You mean the next day when you saw yeah. him, mm -hmm. there were others? Yeah. Wasn't just one. We, we walked over some as the infantry killed them. I told you earlier, they left them. They left them wherever they lay. Uh, in Luzon, just before we finished clearing out behind the summer capital in the mountains, we were set up one evening for a bivouac and it's a trail about uh, 1,500 yards in front of my position. So I set my gun up and pointed it at that trail and estimated the range for 1,500 yards and said, told him, said, when the sun comes up tomorrow, I'm going to shoot on that trail and there'll be somebody on it. And they said, no, it ain't going to be nobody over there. But anyway, when the sun came up behind us, it came up over the hill. And eventually, that trail came up. You could see the uh, path around where people had been running or animals. And it turned out to be people. And I emptied two belts of ammunition over there, but my first belt, it ran a half a dozen people in three or four different directions, but uh, I don't know whether I killed anybody, but I certainly woke them up. That's the, the only people I ever saw that I fired that machine gun at a particular person. I fired at emplacements, I fired at the woods, I fired at where people told me people, there were people. In uh, most cases, there were people. Whether I hit them or somebody else did, it was not determined by me, but I had done what I was sent over there to do. How did you know that there would be Japanese there in the morning? I could see it because the sun came up behind me, and as it, you know, it came up, the daylight came up beside the hill, and then it illuminated the pass. The path. When the sun came came up, it illuminated the uh, path, and I could saw figures moving on it. I knew I had set for my from my rounds to drop over there, so I set my hand on the trigger, and around a 250 unit belt through it, so I ended up with about 250 rounds on each side of that path and in the middle of the path, and at the beginning and the end. And I saw figures moving, getting away from it. So I don't know what, it, what good I did, but I disturbed somebody's breakfast, I'm sure.
D didn't you say earlier that you saw some of them drop? Well, oh yeah, they were dropping and moving. They were rolling and getting out of there. We, that far away, you don't see whether they lay there or not, because that's the path. You couldn't see the ground on it. You just saw the opening in the woods around the edge of the hill. Anyway, it was just a thought, and I wanted to shoot my gun, too. <laughs> Later on, did you investigate? Did you go further to see what? Nope. The infantry walked up that hill, but we didn't. We went around it. When you when you, you don't climb any hills when you're carrying a, a 52 pound tripod unless you have to. You definitely, obviously, you know, you were in combat, um, but would you agree that the, I guess the the riflemen is that the toughest role in the whole? That's that's the ones that have the worst time. Of all the branches, of all, it's the riflemen who have it toughest. Is that right? The, that that's the one. The riflemen whether he be Marine or whatever, or Army, whatever it is, he's the one that touches the enemy all the time. He touches him first and last. And it, it, whoever there is that manages them, they take all the credit, but that joker does all the work. I said that I was in the, if I had to be in the infantry, I was probably in the best company. I, I did mean to ask you, when you were in combat, did you have any experiences against Japanese artillery or mortars? Well, we have mortars, yeah. You just get flat. You just don't. You don't stand up. A mortar explodes. The projectiles go from the point of explosion up. They go at angles up and then straight up, but but they don't go down. So you get flat. Chances are you're not going to get anything but dirt, yeah. You don't know, you just, it just shows up, all of a sudden it blangs. Hand grenades are the same way. You don't, uh, but the infantry, that's, that's who they're trying to hit not until you open up with a machine gun, and then they'll try to hit you, but um, they got to be pretty thick for you to, to settle in on a machine gun. And it's like I say, if you just don't put your hand on the trigger, they ain't gonna know you're there. Where did you experience most Japanese mortar fire? It was, well, in the mountains there, you did it all the time, but they have a limited. By the time we got there, they were limited on ammunition. And, and they had to have a pretty clear field to, to a number of people before they'd waste mortar, mortar rounds. See, they would have nobody bringing them wep weapons or ammunition. They were defeated. They were defeated. They'd, they would have died out in those countries if we hadn't have gone in, unless they had interbred with them, and then you just had another mixed nation. <laughs> um, I firmly believe if you left them alone, they would either the people would have slowly killed them because the they had been the men, yeah, and some of the women that had been terribly mistreated, they would figured out a way to kill them because they didn't carry the women over. So they raped and mutilated and missed, and not too many people will live live with that long. Did when you guys interacted with the civilians? Um, did they explain to you just how brutal the Japanese had been? Oh, yeah, yeah. They did. Some of the young boys would say, uh, you want my sister? We'll get, we, you can have my sister for so and so and so and so. Because the Japs were going to just knock them in the head and take them anyway. It, it, it's, it's, it, it's a, a, a bad thing. The Japanese were, were terrible people. Were there any other times when you were in combat that you saw Americans around you getting hit? Oh yeah, but that's, you always have somebody to, to see them. I even went in the hospital down there. Not for that, I'm, a, I'm afraid to tell you what it is. It was recording it, but anyway, it was, it was in a field hospital in a, in a tent, and it was on Luzon. <clears throat> but they had, 
bunks of people in there that were, you know, they were injured in various stages. But uh, I didn't see that many. I saw people being hauled off, but uh, out. But I saw a whole hospital full of them. So we had we had casualties. What What was the reason you were at the hospital? I was sick. Okay. <laughs> Now I was constipated. That's one of the things. And I had malaria. That was one of the things. And uh, I was tired. 30 days walking through the hills without having a bath, not no new socks, and lots of stuff I didn't eat. So I was just worn out. So that was not too long before I came home. It, it, I would still have gone to Japan, but anyway, uh, when I checked out in Mississippi, I weighed 143 pounds. What were you when you went in? 185. But can you describe other situations in combat? What would The reason I'm asking this is I want people to get an accurate idea of what war is, because a lot of young people... When they think of war, they think about the movies. Oh, yeah. And it's not accurate. No. And so I guess I'm trying to get from your memories, when you saw American casualties, how did it play out? Well, yeah, somebody, you, but you just walking along and therefore uh, uh, hit, something hits you. Or now if, you, if you're close to a mortar cell, there's going to be a whole lot of people get a piece of metal in them. You don't do that very often either. And I didn't see that many, but I could see in the in the units around me, you would see a uh, year one go off, and then you'd see people getting patched up. I mean, it's, uh, you really bleed. I mean, it's not... It's, it's, a, it's a random shoot. It's, it's just a random thing. You don't, uh, <clears throat> from the position we were in, we never had masses of people. Like, the, you see the Marines when they're getting off, they got off. You couldn't tell to tell when one, one phase of the Marines going in, the others ran over them because they were making an initial and it was bad. We made our beachheads where they, it was... They had already pulled a lot of people from these islands to reinforce the others. So their beaches were not manned that much. So even going in, you didn't run into where there was just, you know, mass shells blowing. It wasn't like going into Europe. That was, that was bad. I mean, you, and that was the way it would have been. Well, you could see it because they gave you some news things. And we sit on our side of the world and looked over there and said, man, I'd hate to be there. And that's, that's the way it is. And I'm sure they sat on their side thinking the same thing about you guys. Thinking the same. Well, they saw initially the, where the Marines made it. That was the full Japanese military they were going against. I mean, they, they had not been thinned out. You, you hit some. It's just what it looked like at Normandy, and it's just what it looked like in some of those newsreels where the Marines went in early. It was bloody. And uh, people, they, they, if they were hit hard enough, they didn't move. If they were not, that's, that's my wife coughing. And then they were still struggling to get away from them if they could. And they were bleeding. It, it wasn't something that... And, and you know, just, just, you, if you know you should move from where you are, you try to move. Did, did, and you don't even have to think about it. It, it. I didn't think about, do I need to pull Snyder over here? It was a reflex. I didn't knock my gun over because I was standing with both feet on this side, not sitting with one or one on the other side. I didn't knock. I didn't, I didn't make many bushes move. I moved. And quick. 
it's a, it, if you think back over it, it it's not something you think it in steps because it was just doing hmm. did you guys ever take japanese prisoners do you do you remember any japanese being captured alive oh yeah because it ordered us to we didn't we didn't take any prisoners that we didn't have to what does that mean <coughs> that means that the elimination time is eliminated, it's gone. Uh, that means when we walk by one, he's, he's dead. If if regiment said, we got to have a prisoner, and called down and said, for the 149th Infantry, to bring a prisoner from up where, up, up, up where y'all are, we need to talk to him. Then... Somebody up there would get the word and they'd go hunt up a prisoner and they'd wound him, bandage him, put him on a stretcher and carry him back. And if they could think of a reason to kill him before they got there, they would and say he tried to get away. This is all stuff you've heard or did you see this happen? No, I saw it happen. I and if it had been me, I'd have done the same thing. I mean, can, what, what, what part of that did you see? I saw him, they brought him back, and uh, they caught him, in what, he, was, he was at all four farms, no holes, but when he got back as far as we were, one of them had pulled his pistol and put a hole in the shoulder just so it could, you know, let him know, hey, you've been screwing around. So they walked him up, and he managed to bandage him where we were, and he walked him up to on the next hill and gave him a cigarette and lit it and shot him while he was smoking it and rolled him off, off the trail and came back down and said, you had to call him and tell him we got to go get another prisoner. He tried to get away. It, it, it's, you just, you know, it's, it's, they killed us. I mean, it wasn't we were doing something that they didn't do. On it, they used some of our people for for bayonet practice, tied them up. I, I heard about that. Did you come across? Now, I didn't do that, but now the rifle company that they did that they to said some they of their that. people, they came back and brought the people. They had holes in them, right? Bayonet holes. You saw that. I told that. I mean, after you see Americans being used for bayonet practice, what does that do to you? Well, you ain't going to do nothing. It, it don't do anything to you. It just tells you you're not going to do anything for them. They didn't have a life on that island if, if we tried to bring them back, and we would have to feed them. I wouldn't have brought one back. I mean, I know I would just have shot him. I'm sure it happened so many times. I mean, in a, in a, at least you would put them out of their misery. If it was the Japanese, they would torture you first. They torture you first. It's a, and and you could talk to those kids and things that, because they they learned English quick. They'd tell you what what they did to their people. They 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 mistreated them bad. The civilians. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm, I'm sure that, you know, obviously not all the Japanese were evil. There were a lot of them that were forced Well, there to... were some of them as good. You're bound to be. Yeah. But the majority of them would have done what that guy did. May not have given you a cigarette. <laughs> when we were in combat, the enemy we walked past, we walked past them. Or we sat down wherever we were. If there was some here, and they were right, people rotted immediately because of the heat and the moisture in the air. And uh, I remember a couple of occasions, not just one, that I had my lunch and there's a Jap over there with maggots crawling around in, the, in his eyes, open mouth, wherever shot. And you just, you stink like them anyhow, so you just put it out of your out of your head and do what you do. I mean, you obviously would never do that if it was an American. 
But no, the Americans, we picked them up and carried them back. We, it, 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 you'd, even if you didn't have a medic, you'd get him up and take him. You don't leave, you don't leave your people anywhere, even when you're pushed. I mean, the, was it just because you were so used to seeing the enemy dead that well, it didn't matter, or you were just so tired you didn't want to? Well, move? you're tired. You're not going to walk too far away because there may be another one over there too because, you know, somebody's got to occupy that space. And, and you go off the path and off the, the clearing, you're in a jungle. So you just, you just do the best you can. What do you remember about your reunion with the family when you first came back home? Well, my first was I had, from uh, Camp Shelby, Mississippi, I had called my father and told him that I was, would be home on a certain day, about on the bus. Well, he knew when the buses were coming. And when I got to the bus station, I got out and saw him uh, what was that like to see your girlfriend after being overseas for so long? Well, I didn't really think she was my girlfriend. I knew she was a girl that hung around with my baby sister. You know, we hadn't really clicked girlfriend, boyfriend, or when. But now she wrote me because that's uh, periodically, and I'd drop her a note periodically. But yeah, it was, she was there to meet me. And so it was a she's, she's been there to meet me the rest of her life. So how long after that did you guys get serious and then you married? About, uh, well, let's see. It was about almost a year, not quite a year. Did you uh, have any difficulties readjusting to civilian life? None at all. I shed that military just like it was uh, uh, washing in the dirt all. Really? Yeah. No they, nightmares? I, I figured they hadn't done me right, but anyhow, that's okay. I went and did it. N no, no. But I got no. even. Now, I'm going to quit on this one. I got even. I got married, built her house. We lived in that house about six months, and a recruiter came by. Too many people got out. They, they freed it, and, and Europe cleared out pretty good. People were fed up, and everybody got out. We got out, and they let too many people out. And they came back offering stuff. And I was con happy building houses. I know, I know how to build houses. I can build one in my sleep. But... Anyway, I, I thought about it. I thought about it all the time I was working. I liked wearing a uniform. I liked, I liked to be able to do things. And I always wanted to be the supervisor. So he came by and I said, I want to change from an infantry MOS. I don't care what it is said, we got some vacancies in artillery. I said, I know about artillery. They don't get closer to the front, much closer than I did, and that, that's okay. But they're shooting big guns, and there's somebody shooting back at them. I was in the middle, if I didn't say nothing. <laughs> anyway, it wasn't that. It was sort of thoughts on it. <laughs> so anyway, I took communications officer in a... In a Field drawn artillery. That's and I, I signed up to go to Fort Seal. That's my first place to go. And then I went home and told Hazel. And I said I sold your house, and we're going to in back in the army. Told my brother and told my dad. And they said that ain't smart. And I said well, my brother said. He had the construction company, and I was framing houses. I framed them and got them dry, and I'd move over and put them, lay them out and frame them. 
get them dry. And then he said, you know, you, you, you and I could work together like this right on. But anyway, I said, no, I think I'm going to try it again. So I did. When I got out of Fort Seal, I got through it, and they said, hey, at Fort, uh, Fort Bliss, they got, got a signal core down there that's working on radar. That's the one that shot the moon, you know, and got a return and said, uh, you can go to that. It's a year. I said, hmm, that sounds good. I set up a year in Fort Bliss. So anyway, I got another promotion and went to Fort Bliss. I got out of there, got warrant officer. I'm going to shorten this up. Got out there, got the warrant officer, and then come Korea. And there's what my dad and Tom said, you're going to get in another war. The 226 anti-aircraft artillery group needed a warrant officer that was in radar maintenance. And I had just gone to the radar maintenance school for a year in Fort Bliss. In September in 1950, they showed up at Fort Bliss, and I joined the staff as a warrant officer. Two years later, I'm a warrant officer on the staff, and I'm in a, I'm in a position of a major that didn't know how to train op radar operators. I knew how to train them, and I knew how to fix the radar, and I did it for two years for a colonel and a lieutenant colonel. And I did both jobs for two years. And that colonel was the Southeastern GMAC CEO for GMAC, or General Motors. He handled their finances. And he told me, he said, you need to go back with us. He, he was a colonel in it. He'd been in World War II, I think, too. He was a colonel in that 226. And his exec was a president of the bank in Birmingham, Birmingham Bank and Trust. And he was the president and CNO of that organization. He was in the guard, and I thought, and they said, you, you need to go back. Well, by then I had two kids. And the colonel says, you've done a good job. And that captain I sent off from here a year and a half ago, he couldn't do it at all, and you're doing both, and you did it for me for two years. That I can give you a direct commission today for what you did. And that colonel from the bank said, you won't have to move if you go back. You won't be transferred and play, play. And then the other colonel said, I know you work good, and said, they're a smart bunch of people back in that guard in Alabama, but they're lazy. They're smart, but they're lazy. So they don't, they don't want to work. And he said, I've seen you work every day. You've never shucked the deal. And I told Hazel, I said, I think I'm going back with him. I resigned as a warrant officer. One day, signed up as a second lieutenant. The next day, can't do two both on the same day. Because you can't have it one day's pay. And uh, I went back 17 years later. I'm a general. I have been to 15 or 20 of the major schools of all branches, armor, infantry, signal corps, commanding general staff college, the Air War College out at Maxwell, and another 20 or 30 of others. I've been briefed on the nuclear weapons two or three times, and I'm sitting in a room with three and four star people and super people from, that wear fancy suits. And here I am, all this time later, I'm 97 and a half years old. I've been retired almost 43 years. I can live any damn way I want to. And I guarantee you every day I can get up and say, I have done nothing that didn't contribute to the United States of America in some good way. I have not done nothing. 
and and an asshole. And I, I talk. I'm going back to my real country, being in the military to talk of the time. In Washington, that can say that because every one of them are getting richer by the day, off of the taxes, and they're pissing it away and giving it to other countries that wouldn't, they wouldn't spit on us, giving money away. I'm I'm through for the day. What what life advice do you want to give to future generations? Your grandkids, great grandkids, great great grandkids, what do you want them to know for their lives? I want them to know peace. And that's not somebody going wanting to come to kill you because his religion says uh, if you don't believe I will wait, he's supposed to kill you. I just want peace, peace. I don't want race to be any way but nailed and void. Let nature take its course. God has a plan. What kind of person do you want to be remembered as, sir? A Christian. In all my dealings, an honest person. A person that lives life that I don't want to hurt anybody unless I accidentally do or unless I have a real reason to. Other than that, a Christian I'll accept it as an American Christian. A World War II veteran? World War II veteran, that's incidental. I, yeah, I'd like to be remembered as a World War II veteran. I'd like to be remembered as somebody that trained people that helped over in Korea, because Korea is, is a thing for us. A good father, a good husband? A good father, a good husband. That comes from being a Christian. That's what, that's what a Christian is to start with. Why do you think the Japanese, I'm not saying they were easy to kill, but... Oh no, they weren't easy to kill now. But, but there, there were so many casualties compared to American. But they didn't have the, they didn't have the backup we had. We had backup for ammunition. We had backup for some replacements. We had, now we didn't get the right amount of replacements, but we did have. It could have been shorter if we had got our share of replacements. But we didn't until Europe was winding down. Yeah, because there was a Europe first strategy. Yes, it was. And that was Roosevelt. That's what I asked you earlier. Did you have nightmares after the war? That's not a nightmare. I'm just, I just sleep lightly. If I'm supposed to wake up at 3 o'clock, I wake up at 3 o'clock within 10 minutes. Without an alarm? Without an alarm. I don't ever set an alarm. Mm -hmm. My son will tell you. No, I, I believe you. Did your religion, was it tested at all during the war? Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's... I had no, no Christian or, or religious ter uh, difficulty with anything. If it took me aiming at somebody standing there and shooting them, and he had been shooting at us, I can, I can no problem. The Lord didn't say that. He said, you'll not kill. That means I wouldn't just walk up because you're sitting there and I happen to be bigger than you that I kill you. But if I got a good reason, he'll forgive me if I do. If I know you're going to kill somebody, that's another one coming. <laughs>